It's time for our panel with us today. Sarah Sparks, Andrea Vance and Jenny Marcroft. Tena koutou. welcome to the programme. Thanks for your time. Let's get straight into it. It's been a testing week for the new health minister. Dodgy data, blown out waiting times. Andrea, does she give you confidence she's on top of the challenging portfolio? Um... That's I a no already. Yeah, I didn't, get a, I didn't get a lot from that interview, I have no. to say. I mean, she made all the right noises. Mm. Um, and I suppose, if you're being fair, she's new to the job. Mm. However, um, you know, there is a collective responsibility in Cabinet. A lot of these problems are long-standing. Mm. They haven't been solved. Just because we have a new minister, they're not immediately going to be solved. And I think a lot of what she said, um, she's got a good heart and her heart's in the right place. But if you're sitting in ED at the moment, waiting six, seven, eight hours, mm. your child is sick. Um, if you're struggling to access mental health services, for instance, none of the things that she said will have been of any help to you or probably not inspire any confidence. Right, so I just wonder, is she, Jenny, is she connecting to the audience? Is she, is it, is it more bureau bureaucratic, her response? Or is she actually making a connection to the people that need the services the most? Well, I think she is, uh, She's right across her portfolio. She's, mm. She comes from a really solid background in health. So she knows the machinery of health. She's yep. also, uh, you know, taken on this portfolio partway through the health reforms. And if we think about the workforce issue, which has been plaguing the government for the last couple of years, particularly through COVID, you know, we have an international deficit of health workers around the world. So we're not isolated in this. We're competing in a market mm. where big economies are already uh, fighting for that workforce. That's right. We can't compete dollar for dollar for them. All we've got is New Zealand. It's a great place to live. Come and come and work here. So there are some challenges outside of her control. She did put, yeah, but she did push back on that. She, Sarah, she was saying that, you know, we've got, you know, 1,700 doctors, 4,000 nurses, acknowledges it's not good enough. And so she is, she, uh, I found her that she, she did push back a bit in that interview about those kinds of things. And she also talked about the mental health resources, saying they've got an excellent program now. So, you know, she's a PhD in, in, in public health. She's got the overview, but is she going to connect to the people on the ground, say, to Tairafati or, or wherever, who need services on the ground? Well, firstly, I think that she's got a grip of what's happening, and she's only been in the driver's seat for a very short time, so okay. we've got to be fair. All right. uh, and she is trying to work at pace. She's look, I'm looking at her, and, and it needs surgery before rehab, and she's making some surgical decisions, but at the end of the day, she's only as good as the engine Mm. around here. So there's a huge responsibility here for the strategy that's ha happening at Health New Zealand. What are the priorities? Let's get pragmatic. There needs to be some action going in terms of frontline, primary care, yeah, okay. and that dovetails into what you're saying about uh, mental health and all the programs. You know, what is the strategy? And it needs to flex. It needs to be adaptable to these constant changing conditions. Yeah, and we've had, had a lot of those. Are they being quick enough, though, Andrea, in terms of rolling out a plan to to support Kiwis have been through all these multiple disasters? I mean, no, clearly no. not. Yeah. Um, I think ultimately, if you're looking at it from a political point of view, there's a very short runway to the election. I can't imagine that anything she's going to do going into what's going to be a pretty tumultuous winter for the health service is really going to make that much difference for people who are thinking about their uh, voting priorities in October. So this, is this, Jenny, going to be a, a weak point for the government? Just like Andrea says, it's a short runway into the election, multiple multiple disasters and, and a bad winter coming. Oh, absolutely. And it's got to be, a, you know, the front of mind for the minister yeah. because we have these reforms, you know, the legislation in place, pay orders there, um, the... Entities have been established, but we're not. We haven't seen yet what is the model of care. Mm. You know, we've mm. got a restructuring document that hasn't landed yet. Uh, Tefatu Order has not uh, made that public yet. So there's all of these things still to play out. And when we get that model of care, then we're going to be able to know. Okay, how is primary care going to be integrated and sucking up more of these patients to stop them ending up in secondary care? All of those issues will Along, become revealed, but we don't know what is yet going to happen and this is what it's been like a holding pattern for the last couple of years. Okay well we'll hold on and wait and see what happens then we'll keep the holding pattern going. Let's move on to wetlands. Andrea I just want to come to you first you've extensively covered this. When you were doing reporting on sort of the slight rollback in wetlands regulations what did you make of the government's sort of move there? We're, I mean we've heard from uh, Forest and Bird saying you know they're two-faced and they've been lobbied by industry to, to make those changes. I mean um I guess on one level it was shocking to me because I sort of learned about it in the aftermath of the Auckland flo flooding and, and when the cyclone was bearing down on us. Mm. So we were obviously, I was obviously very, as most of the country was, very aware of, um, you know, 
the risks of building in certain places and the damage that flooding can do. Um, on the other hand, I wasn't surprised because any time that the government tries to do any kind of environmental protection, the sheer weight of industry lobby comes down on them. And I've been doing this reporting for a long time. Yeah. And it's just a pattern. It doesn't matter what government in, is in office. And so... Um, this week, um, for the Sunday Star Times, I spent the week looking at um, submissions on the new uh, bills that will replace the RMA. Mm. So <laughs> quite a tedious week for yeah, me. Yeah, no, that's uh, <laughs> <a> pretty <laughs> stuff for you. Yeah, and so, and so um, you're already starting to see, with that legislation, the same pattern emerging. So, you know, people are unhappy that the environmental protection contained in that bill isn't clear enough and is subject to lots of exemptions and trade-offs. And what was really interesting is a lot of the, the industry submissions mentioned this wetland issue really and they use an example of oh well you got it wrong we don't want to see that happen again we don't ah, want the okay. government to um, put in protections that make life unworkable for us so, so you can't get when it comes to trying to protect nature and the critical natural infrastructure that we have it's almost impossible so so industry is using what's happened with the wetlands rollback as a precedent for contesting the rma reforms sarah i mean we're talking about only 10 percent of wetlands natural wetlands remaining in New Zealand. And as, as, as again, uh, Nicola Toki said, you know, uh, a lot of it is, is Māori whenua, where the, the livelihoods and the kai have been taken away. And so should there be greater protections around them? Absolutely. Wetlands are our lungs of Papa Tuanuku. You know, this is a values-based kōrero. We need leadership and government to make the hard, ballsy calls to say, we're not going there. Mm. It's too late once the legislation gets tinkered with to argue it in court. And quite frankly, you know, my hapu have been fighting to protect our wahi tapu in Nelson. And, and it's too late and it's too expensive. They actually need to listen to local community. They need to listen to mana whenua and do it properly the first time. And that is prioritising Mother Nature. Because, you know, even in, I was listening to you uh, in the interview around what's happening in the city. How relevant is it for mm. the people in the city? from their perspective. Well, you've just got to look at what happened in Christchurch, you know, with liquefaction. And, you know, property developers coming in on the fringes and building all these beautiful developments. But mm. then, you know, places cop it. So we need to get real. We okay. need to get pragmatic in that area as well. OK. I'm going to move on to... I mean, we're talking about politics and lobbying. Let's talk about the politics of the people, a national... Uh, Front and centre this week, targeting consultants and contractor wasteful spending by the government. Did that strike a chord, Jenny? Not with me, no. no? Why no. not? I, I just felt that it was... Um, it, 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 you know, we, we do know that when you've got a massive change programme in government, you are going to have more consultants. Mm. So if you look at the health sector, how many people have been poured into that to, to work through these reforms? I, I personally, I, yes, yes, maybe there could be a bit of tinkering around the edges, but yeah. not, you know, not when they're putting up what was quite a good policy in terms of the early childhood. So is it, is it, is it yeah, so putting up a good policy, yeah. but, and then they go down that. Is yeah. it just a, is, Andrew, is it an easy hit for an opposition party just to go straight in for, like, consultancy fees? Yeah, I, I guess, and, and, you know, hats off to National, they probably did dominate the conversation a little bit. Yeah. That, but this, this week, I mean, as... Jenny says, I'm not sure that it resonated with a whole lot of people outside <laughs> comfortable Wellington households. Right. Okay. But, um, but it goes back to, as Jenny said, it is actually quite an interesting policy worth talking about and why they th felt that they had to, to have this kind of cost trade-off. You know, if you, if you want good outcomes, you have to spend the money, but we're in, this, we're in this cycle of trying to prove that you can cost something and afford it. But I did think... It was an odd choice of a policy launch for a state-of-the-nation speech. Your yeah. big flag you know, flagship speech of the year where you set out your priorities. You know, obviously childcare is a good one, but consultants, I'm not sure that that should have been something. All right. Uh, uh, Sarah, uh, we've seen, like, the, the two Chris's go head-to-head -head in the house now. I mean, ha you got any feeling of how they're squaring up? <laughs> OK. <laughs> Does your silence say more than words? <laughs> Well, <laughs> or you don't care. I'm at, I'm at the flex roots, and yeah. you know I'm about what actually is happening to the real people down at the flex roots, and mm. you know what goes on in, in the house mm. and the optics of it. it mm. For me, it's about 
you know, the leadership and the decisions that are affecting real people okay. on the ground. All right, but I am going to ask uh, you guys, uh, Jenny, uh, Chris, Chris, who's coming out on top so far? Oh, definitely, it's the Prime Minister. Prime Minister? Um, the Leader of the Opposition, through his um, State of the Nation speech, within mm. two minutes I noticed I was cleaning the kitchen cupboards, which, <laughs> which you know, kind of says it all, really. Does, does he capture all right. <laughs> New Zealand? OK, Not and really. just, just quickly, I'm just going to run out of time, Andrea, Chris V. Chris, um, we've seen a bit of a bump in the polls for Labor, but it's still national going to form a coalition. So oh. is, is Chris Hipkins going to, to get him over the line or not? I mean, super close. I wouldn't want to call the election. I don't think that would be a bad idea at this point. But I do think <laughs> what's interesting is that um, Jenny's kind of gut reaction mm. um, is built into the polls, and you're starting to see when it, when it comes to Chris Hipkins' favourability ratings, that's mm -hmm. now a built-in trend. So if I was Chris Verlox, I'd be quite worried and, you know, in focusing intensely on turning that around, getting people to like him. OK, we will leave it there for the moment. Thank you so much to our panel, Jenny Markroff, Andrea Vance and Sarah Sparks.